So what is Careg? Careg is a, is a brand new company, a, um, a startup of seniors guy. Um, I'm the youngest one who is 25 years experience in real estate, mostly in offices, but also in other segments. And why do we found this company? We found this company with the idea of creating a new pipeline between the two biggest real estate market in Paris. The first one, you know it very well, this is the office market. Uh, 54 million square meters as far as the, 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 the office of his stock is concerned but also more than 200 million square meters of housing. And um, as you may know, office usually become obsolete after 50 years, so we can say that roughly 2% of the 54 million square meters is getting is, gets obsolete after uh, after this 50 years period. So it represents one of 1 million square meters uh, becoming uh, obsolete every year. So this is maybe the biggest value add office stock you can find in Europe. And uh, as a t uh, at the time we speak, you have more than maybe 10 million square meters of office which has really obsolete, so there's still rent for some. The other one is called the stretch hole vacancy, the most, the biggest part of the 5.5% the you saw uh, in the charts. And uh, on the other hand, uh, you have this uh, residential market with a huge shortfall of 300,000 um, units. 300,000 units. If you assume a 50 square meters per unit, it represents 15 million square meters of shortfall. So have you have these two big tank of opportunities with no connection as, a, as of today and so we are trying to create these connections thanks to a couple of catalysts. The biggest one is of course the Grand Paris project which is much more than a simply infrastructure and, 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 uh, and transport project, a new way of looking at Paris. The idea is not to expand Paris but to increase the density. To, this is really the, the biggest supportive renewal project we ever found since uh, Osman, uh, so more than 100 years years ago. The second thing is that we have been creating a new residential unit, but very slowly, not enough. So we are very familiar with the, with the concept of a, a great wall of debt. Believe me, we are creating every day our great wall of homes. It's today, and we are adding a brick every day on this wall. So there is a strong imbalance between the supply and the demand. And so there should be a stronger focus on this on this new opportunity, and this is why we are creating Carag today. Okay, great. Today. Yes, good morning. So, um, Coviview is basically uh, one of the uh, important treat here in Europe with a, a kind of unique positioning because we are uh, we have strong platform uh, in uh, uh, Paris, Milan, and Berlin and we are managing different products. So uh, basically 850 people in the group uh, managing around 22 billion euro of assets focused on offices in Paris and, and Milan, on Resi, mostly in Berlin. Uh, I think we will have also the opportunity to talk about that. And on hotels, and that's uh, also one of the uh, strong area where we want to continue to develop. Uh, hotels all over Europe with the unique opportunity to work with all these uh, hotel operators that are, uh, I would say, trying to develop all over Europe, benefiting from this strong trend of uh, uh, tourism evolution. And uh, basically, we try to uh, build a, a, a very integrated group because in this market, as was uh, uh, mentioned by, uh, uh, by Raphael, there is more and more links uh, between the product. One of the interesting things is, uh, for instance, the, the, the link between office and hotels with the, the flex office, which is, uh, 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 we have a lot to say and to learn from the hospitality sector in the way we are managing these uh, uh, flex office spaces. Also between hotels and uh, 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 resi, uh, and the capacity that we have to be a very integrated group to be able to uh, manage different kind of product, to be, to be able to develop ourselves uh, the product and to be able to service ourselves the product is I think the best way uh, to uh, improve profitability uh, when uh, people try to be more and more specialist and so escape from a part of the profit that you can make on the on the real estate. So that's our purpose, to be uh, more and more integrated, more and more uh, diversified, to be able to be flexible 
and agile also uh, in an environment that is more and more challenging and where you, you need always to be, uh, uh, I would say, on top of new trend to anticipate obsolescence also. Okay, great, Charles. My name is Giles Wintle. I have about 20 years, a bit more than 20 years in real estate. Well, I'm younger, I think. Even younger. Uh, about half of that has been spent in, in finance, one way or another. I started in Jones Lang LaSalle in, in London. I went off and did an MBA and ended up in an investment bank um, doing corporate finance. I was happy enough to spend the crisis uh, in, in London, the great global financial crisis, working for GIC. Um, so I spent five years with them uh, investing all over Europe, but also uh, through the crisis restructuring some of their positions uh, in joint ventures and, and um, funds, uh, both in debt and in equity. In 2011, I came back to France to head the European fund management business for Grosvenor. If you don't know Grosvenor, it's a private property company owned by the Duke of Westminster. And I spent the last seven years there in various roles. Uh, latterly setting, setting up the development business in Madrid uh, and in Paris. And I left Grosvenor about, well, physically, almost nine months ago, um, and I've taken some time out. And right now I'm uh, working on a number of different opportunities. Um, most of what I'm doing is with private investors, normally in the form of family offices. Um, and my key offer to them really is to help them formalize, strategize, um, and organize their real estate investments. So that's, um, that's a, a new business really, it's in its, it's in its early stages, but there's a few things keeping me off the streets already. The other thing I'm involved in are a few um, fintech projects, I'm not sure that's a word of the cycle, a few fintech projects mainly based in London, mainly around the way property is financed and, and traded, which is quite, quite interesting, and perhaps we'll talk more about that later. Benjamin Cartier-Bresson, I'm in charge of the French office at Berlin Hoop, which is a senior lending uh, bank uh, with a, a focus on, on plan brief. Plan brief is really where we are um, extremely uh, good experts, I would say. Um, we are amongst the leading banks in Germany and trying to develop as much as possible in neighbor countries, of which France. These days, the name of the game, uh, as in many industries, is innovation. We are an innovative bank. We have uh, issued the first green bonds, backed by uh, environmentally uh, friendly uh, offices. We have innovated in new products like Emotional Shine. And also, we are deploying massive efforts to, in order to become a modern bank. Modern bank means two things. The first one is very sharp internal rating and pricing tools. And we have done incredible uh, improvements in that sector uh, over the last years, enabling to uh, offer sharp pricings uh, to, to our clients um, um, lately. And also, uh, a modern bank is in the digital uh, area. Um, where we are in a way to interact uh, in a, a new way uh, internally and externally with our clients, i.e. much more via internet platform than, uh, uh, than according to the traditional uh, way, paper or email as, uh, as now. Great, thank you. Alfred. Uh, very simple, I'm a double qualified lawyer in Paris, heading the real estate department in Paris. Two partners around here directly related into real estate, uh, Constance de la Osserie who's doing mainly uh, litigation work and rent uh, negotiations. And on my side it's more the investment and the financing side of real estate. Teams around are about six uh, associates directly related and we are certainly working also with our fund practice and corporate as soon as necessary. And in recent times we can say it was necessary because the transaction will become larger and larger and so far more corporate than pure real estate. Uh, to, to tell a blessing, we can only say it's an international law firm, not directly related to an US law firm. It's a German, English hook up or business combination as we say. I think uh, normally. 
we are about 1,300 lawyers uh, with a very strong foothold in Asia, with offices in Beijing, Hong Kong, and Shanghai, a uh, large office in Singapore, with very good connections into Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, to other local players. Um, in real estate, we are more or less an integrated group of 120, 130 lawyers talking regularly to each other and trying to service uh, real estate and financing uh, as uh, at least internationally and in, in investment. I, I want to dig down a little bit more into particularly how you're seeing the residential opportunities, whether that's also an opportunity that is just for France, this conversion of of office is that is that specific to, to Paris in a way, um, and also you mentioned there the Grand Paris, but we've also got the Olympics coming. Um, how much of those things are, are, are playing into what you see as your investment strategy? I would say that the Resi, the Resi is maybe the best or, uh, alternative for a big tickets player. Uh, imagine that uh, whereas uh, investing 200 million euros in a big, large office building, you invest in four beautiful Resi buildings with 200 tenants. It's a totally different exposure, much more granular, with a very, very uh, slow obsolescence and, uh, and a very high liquidity despite the size, because you can sell to your tenant if you want. And believe me, you can sell everything in a few days. So it's a totally different exposure, but uh, very big. It's a super deep market. And uh, 25 years ago, uh, most of the, 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 the French institutions uh, hold the real estate and real estate in, the, in their portfolios. And now they come back very, very strong. And that's why we're going to help. We're going to try to help them. Um, from a pure financial standpoint, there's also uh, a big reason for them to come back to Resi. Uh, of course, the competition is very hard on, on office, but. Uh, beyond that, uh, we have to remember that now the, the yields are very converged between the two sectors, and despite uh, the fact that the, the, the residential yields are still lower than the office, um, the, the, the rent is also a little bit lower, and so in terms of uh, price per square meters, it's more or less equivalent with to some exceptions like the CBD, or definitely the, the price per square meter is much higher than in Resi. The second thing is about the legal background. The legal background is uh, much more uh, 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 positive now to, uh, for, to convert. We have a so-called new low elan. And uh, the low elan is uh, definitely changing uh, the, the financial equilibrium. And now we, we have some uh, quite comparable total return uh, when we compare both restructuring or converting a scenario, which is very interesting because this is the very first time over the last uh, 25 years we can see that. So this is definitely also a very big change. The other thing is that there's a strong comeback to demographics and, uh, and RESI is highly correlated to demographics and you know that France uh, make a lot of babies. Uh, we are providing more than a third of uh, the financial uh, diploma in finance. We are a very, very young uh, country, much more, and, and Paris more definitely. Do you know that uh, you have 40% um, of the, the population which is less than 30 years old in Paris, which is only 20% in London? So very, very long, very young, very active. And, uh, and, as, and on a very long-term basis, I think that having a, an investment much more correlated to the people and to the demographics and, and maybe less to big corporates could also make sense. So if you have too much exposure on office, it's, uh, this may be a good alternative if you want to have a different exposure. Um, is it really Paris only? I think that Paris is just a very big market. So for that, it... Um, is secure a very big pipe, but I, I think also that for conversion there is uh, we have a very good background. First, for example, if you compare London to Paris, the the average size in a, of an apartment in London is 80 square meters. In Paris, is 50. Um, you have uh, only 20 percent of the people living in in. Um, in, uh, in buildings with more than uh, five stories in London, it's uh, 
two-thirds in Paris, so people used to live in, 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 in big buildings, and, and so on. So, so, the, so, the, so the background is super, super positive for Paris, because it's big, because people uh, used to live in, in large buildings, and, uh, and the market is very, very hot due to this uh, huge shortfall we have. And just, just quickly on that, um, because these, I mean, it was interesting that in Richard's um, presentation you could see that the, the vacancy rates in second-hand buildings were significantly higher than they were for new buildings. Um, does that mean the areas where you're redeveloping um, office, is that really going to be mixed use? Is this part of an area where it's, it's within other office areas and there's also retail? What's, what's the, what, what, what's it look like? Well, I think that now we have to maybe talk a little bit more about the Grand Paris because the, 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 the project of the Grand Paris is to increase the density of the, of the first ring of Paris. Uh, we have a transportation network in a star shape and now we have to connect all these suburbs and, uh, and so it will totally change our way to look at the, at the, at the different cities around Paris. Um, and of course, there are a lot of opportunities there. And so this is a fantastic opportunity to talk with the city, to talk with the urban planners, to redefine, to redesign a little bit the city. And so when you think about uh, converting a, a civil office building into RISI, it means that you need some shopping center, you need schools, you need transport, you need to, to rethink a little bit the city. So that's why at the beginning of my presentation, I thought this is the biggest opportunity to have a renewal project we have in Paris because you really rethink the city with every with all the players by doing so. Let's pick up because, because obviously you've been looking at, at France um, but also within the context of investing in, in the wider Europe. So let's just pick up a little bit on where you think we are at the moment in the cycle I suppose for, for France and also how that compares with the, with the other main markets in Europe. Nice easy one, thank you Richard. Um, <laughs> Let me start by saying uh, something which I think will probably get some wide agreement is we're pretty high in the cycle and the question is more how high and secondly what, what might be the trigger that would, that would change that. If you look at the rental cycle for Paris, uh, rents are at a cyclical high, um, different research houses have a different way of putting it, the Jones Lang property clock is something that people often refer to. Since I used to be an employee of Jones Lang I'll do that, so Paris is at the top of the cycle cyclically but there is virtually no supply as we've heard earlier certainly in the CBD and therefore I think we will see more growth in, in Paris rents. So despite being at the top of the cycle there's probably still a little bit more to do. Um, France I think has changed over the last two years so I've been in France on and off since 1999 as a, as a Brit. My French accent I think has got slightly better but not a whole lot better during that time. And this is the first time, as you picked up earlier uh, from the Frankfurt experience, this is the first time I think that I can sincerely say France is probably at the top of the list uh, in terms of a place to invest because we have um, some pretty strong fundamentals. So we have a good, a good base trend, we have strong GDP growth ahead of the UK for once, for various reasons. We have a political landscape which looks a lot more sensible than it has done for the last 10 years, notwithstanding the um, men in, in uh, yellow vests. Uh, so I think there's some very good, very good basic reasons to invest in France. The other reason, picking up a little bit from what Raphael was saying, is if you look at the Paris market, it's easy to pick on the office market and say, well, it never really gets above a certain level and you're, therefore you're just investing in a, in a bracket. But if you're a bit more imaginative and you look at the residential markets, for example, it's pretty clear to see that the model in, in, in French residential does not mirror what you see in London, New York, Miami, other, other big cities. Um, that is to say that there really are only two products in, in the Paris market. There's the house Menion product and the new product, which I think you could describe as beige, probably. So I think companies like Raphael's company, I'm going to do it for him since he's not here, uh, are quite interesting because they're looking at changing that, changing that model and that probably is where the opportunity is in, in Paris today. And you can, you can start in normal residential if you like and you can very quickly move into the service sectors so aging is a quick one easy one to pick on good demographic trend for investors in aging clearly an aging population and the baby boom is getting older but people living longer as well and yet you have this model where you still basically have two choices you stay at home become a burden on your family or you go to a nursing home and 
is usually viewed as a negative thing. So there's lots to do, and you can continue the conversation to student housing, you can talk about um, co-living, etc. So I think that's probably where there is a lot of opportunity, particularly in Paris, because we're talking about one of the biggest markets in Europe, one of the biggest office markets in Europe, but also one of the largest conglomerations. And at the moment, you've got the political and economic backdrop to make that happen. Elsewhere, did you say? So elsewhere, um, Scandinavia is still interesting, still defying gravity. Um, Sweden in particular had the, the advantage of not really having a financial crisis like the rest of us, having already had it in the 90s and regulated their banking system. Um, I think two years ago we would have been talking about the house price bubble in, in, in Sweden that appears to have subsided somewhat. The office market in Stockholm is extremely tight, um, but I'm sure it, it's going to see some strong growth over the next couple of years. But good luck getting in. Other markets to look at, I think, uh, Madrid, still some growth in the, in the office market. Um, when I was at Grosvenor, we spent a lot of time investing and developing in residential in Madrid. I think that window is probably coming to a close now. Um, broadly speaking, in Madrid, in the high-end residential market, uh, 2007, about 10% of the high-end residential market in Madrid was bought by foreigners. Um, 2017, it was about 60%. So you have 60% of, uh, of the market foreign, generally Latin America, are buying very high-end residential and virtually no developers who can create international standard high-end residential. So Grosvenor weren't the only ones doing that. There were a few of us there. I think there's probably still some, some to do there, but that window's closing. With, it's not becoming an old story. But I think Madrid offices will see, will see some more growth as well. And then for the, the long term, uh, Berlin has got to be on everyone's radar, I think. The question is whether the current pricing allows you to benefit from the future opportunity. Yes, and one of the interesting things actually from Germany, both last year and this year, they're much less positive on Berlin than you would expect. And I think they've all got that completely wrong because they're sitting in the market looking at it from a different perspective. Um, to tell you, you're, you're obviously, you, you were involved in um, residential here. Uh, but you've got a big German portfolio. Um, so just, just highlight a little bit the, the differences between how you see the market here and, and why, you're, why you're looking at the opportunities there in Germany for residential. I have to say that we we, uh, we share what uh, 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 Raphael conviction are and on the the capacity to uh, to invest on on decent level. It's uh, just a question of uh, uh, relative pricing, and I would say uh, um, six years ago uh, we were historically uh, an important player on the on the French resi uh, um, on, on this asset class, uh, trying to uh, develop a, a listed company. Uh, with uh, bringing uh, uh, resi asset from uh, French institutional and I have to say that the limit of this strategy has been the volume it, it was very low uh, liquidity of asset and capacity to grow was uh, was quite tough and the second thing was the profitability uh, with rental growth that was quite limited and that's why we said okay uh, we cannot do everything we are not good at everything and the return that we were expected were much lower. Obviously, the risk was much lower, but uh, our main objective is to, to manage differently uh, the, the risk and return with uh, being uh, more presence uh, overall in Europe, also on different asset classes. And then we decided to, uh, uh, to move to Germany. Uh, it was uh, 10 years ago because we, 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 we saw that uh, uh, there the volume were much bigger and also the, the, the yield and expected rental growth was uh, uh, much uh, easy to, um, I would say, to project. And we have been quite right, huh, I would say, uh, even more when we decided to focus our investment in Berlin. And in fact, today, uh, the, 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 the difference between those two markets is first much more liquidity in Germany and uh, much more rental growth and also a yield that are on absolute level uh, a bit higher. There were a difference between regulation, uh, historically French regulation wa was quite strict. It is changing, uh, but uh, despite that, the, 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 um, I would say the, the, the long-term trends, we are still very positive on Berlin. Uh, the, the, uh, you, you probably 
remember the, the graph of uh, Richard just before. The, this city is really transforming. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing, and we think that it will continue to, to, to be so, because in fact, the city uh, did not anticipate this change. So there is a scarcity in Resi. Uh, there is scarcity also on offices. There's no more, uh, not enough development, and that's why the vacancy rate in Berlin is so low. That's why the, the trends on the rental growth uh, on Resi is uh, between five to ten percent each year. And this is a problem also for 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 politicians and for the city. But the problem is that in terms of urbanization, etc., we have a good example with, uh, with Paris and the Grand Paris that is anticipating the next step. Uh, the Berlin city has not anticipated this uh, uh, new uh, attractiveness of the, of the city that has a direct impact on the way the real, the real estate market is, uh, is structured. Okay, good. And um, Benjamin, interesting new Berlin here, obviously. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> developing. Um, just give me a quick update. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, Giles there, the Gilets Jaunes, and there was a, it's certainly, a, if you're sitting in the UK, and obviously this was the case in Germany as well, it's a large part of the news. Um, are you getting questions about that from your German colleagues? How much of an issue is it, and how is it actually seen if you're, if you're sitting and working in France? It's good that you asked the question, because I was in Berlin yesterday. I showed pictures on my iPhone on, of the Champs Elysees on Saturday that I went down, and the sole reaction that I had was, yeah, well, for France, something that, that happens regularly, isn't it? While, well, if, if, you, if you've been there on, on Saturday, you could notice that it's something unprecedented, I, I, I believe, and quite frightening. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> so do you think it's a significant... Do you think it's a significant movement? Do you think that's therefore a change in terms of the perception of Macron, or do you think this is just a small... No, no, I think that has limited uh, impact on the perception of uh, foreigners, which remain globally extremely positive. There's really before and after Macron, and I think that will, that will last. That might have to do as well with the fact that in, in Europe or in the world uh, in general, uh, instability uh, has become the, the standard, uh, really. Even in Germany, it's, it's become difficult for Mrs. Uh, Merkel to, uh, to govern the, the country. So, relatively to the, the others, well, we are in a quite good position, I, I think. Okay, good. And Alfred, in terms of um, in, in terms of what you're seeing in the market, let's pick up quickly what you're seeing in terms of international capital. Um, are you seeing new capital with this renewed interest in, in France and with what's happening in terms of um, Grand Paris and the Olympics? Are you seeing different sorts of capital, new capital, wanting to access the markets here? Um, what can I say to that? Uh, I think uh, to catch up with Rezi, the first time I, that we have accompanied somebody in a major Rezi transaction was this year which is signed but not yet closed. Uh, we were part of the um, acquisition of uh, 4,000 apartments, 1.4 billion, which was uh, privatized, quote unquote, by the SNCF. So we were in a, in a very interesting large transaction where people were also telling us that the German client we were uh, accompanying in that, that they are looking into France because it's one of the European biggest resi markets. They just did one transaction in Sweden for 1.2 billion and said, well, we have now to wait for a couple of years to come uh, across a, a transaction like that. So that was the first time that I saw Germany coming in with for resi investment. Currently, we are very much talking to um, Singaporean investors who are also quite interested to get into France. Uh, it's not only the sovereign funds uh, who are were already around for a couple of years, uh, Demasek and CIC, CIC, CIC uh, who are, were always buying and selling, but now there are also corporates uh, and other people, Trust Capital for example was looking into, into Europe. Uh, that's new for us to see that there are also other investors getting the way into France. Uh, then I think 
the money which we have always seen coming in from uh, the Middle East is still there, but that is uh, the family offices which are channeled in our firm via London into France very often. Uh, and in so far there's nothing new on that side, uh, but I have the first questions coming out of Latin America. That's something which we haven't seen for a very long period of time, that people from Latin America are interested to get into France. So, uh, and they are looking more in hospitality, hotel, what they are looking for, like also the Koreans we have on our agenda for huge hotels, but they are looking five stars, more than 300 rooms in Paris. So, which is not something they are really seeing so often. I think it's so far there's somebody who has bought over the last couple of months two big hotels <laughs> who has taken already a little bit uh, heat out of the market in this area. Uh, and I think from my perspective is what I hear. So Austrians are coming back, the Germans are looking around, and what is mind-boggling to me is simply that the transactions they are looking in are not the single asset transactions. They are more or less looking into portfolios. And that is a trend, at least in our, in our practice, to see that people are not, not, no longer looking in single transactions, and asking also from time to time if there's nothing uh, which is an insolvency they can really buy uh, to de redevelop and reposition the market. That are also a number of questions coming up in, the, in that area because they have heard about one or two assets which are in distressed situations and I think uh, uh, Accor was a happy winner of the bid for a big hotel portfolio recently which was an insolvency. So uh, there might be other assets which are also already in the Redos Mojicien and Solvency Proceedings where people are looking into currently. Okay, good. Um, interesting about the flight of capital obviously out of Latin America, presumably Brazilian money because of this, it, the, the, the change of regime there. Um, to go, um, in, in Frankfurt, one of the key things that they, we haven't used the Brexit word yet, I've just used it now, uh, but it was used within about the first the three seconds of the discussion in Frankfurt um, because they were seeing quite a positive um, uptake in terms of office, but also movement. Frankfurt, obviously, a much, much smaller town than Paris. Um, but has it been successful, the sort of, um, you know, tired of the fog, try the frogs campaign that was across the UK? Um, is that making a difference? Is that making a difference to the office environment here? Are you actually seeing concrete changes in terms of, of more uptake from people moving out of London or deciding not to be in London and deciding to choose Paris instead? What is sure is that there's less and less French in, in London. Huh? Uh, uh, I, I had some friends yet that they're saying they are just alone now, so they are all moving back, either on Paris or, or in other uh, European cities. Um, I'm not sure that this is massive. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, that significant uh, and explain the good dynamic of the Paris market. The Paris market is dynamic as itself, uh, due mainly to the development of, uh, of the, the existing uh, tenant and existing corporate. So on top of that, there is a marginal new uh, take-up due to uh, uh, banks uh, moving uh, some of the people they had previously in London, but uh, you know it's not a huge amount of people. Uh, so uh, I would say that it's positive overall because it's uh, attracting a, a high level of population, so high level of spending also, etc. It's also uh, positive for the, the, I would say, the, the atmosphere of the city. Uh, and on the other side, I would say that, uh, uh, to come back to what has been said just before, the attractiveness of, pa of Paris coming back to the investment market uh, has also a bit to do with the, uh, uh, the, 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 the poor outlook of the London market. Market. So London market was the uh, first and top of the list for decades. Uh, now it's no more the case. And, and, and when you look at all the European cities, obviously Paris is the, the much well positioned. So uh, I think this trend is uh, maybe much stronger than the one on the, uh, on the Latin market, I would say. Yeah, I, I fully agree on that. And uh, in my mind, um a massive change in terms of uh, moves from the UK to Paris from large companies 
has started but is not really significant. You cannot really notice it in, in France yet. But if the Brexit uh, materializes, then it will happen because uh, really the fundamentals in, in Paris is that it's the best uh, place to, to work in Europe after uh, London, really, when you see the, the size of the market, when you see uh, infrastructure. So the fundamentals will be reflected in the changes in the, in the near future. So that will come to me. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add, I think that if you, if you can, as I do, consider cities as competing with each other globally as opposed to countries competing with each other, <clears throat> then surely Paris's biggest problem has been the success of London. Because London speaks English, it's a very, very kind place for money to go to, we could say. Uh, straightforward legal system, plenty of extremely good uh, lawyers, not that there aren't in Paris. Uh, and, and also a very good place to find talent, so it's an obvious place for companies to go. Now, if Brexit changes that, which it looks like it will, that will be, in my view, a benefit for Paris. And when you add to that the fact that a lot of that talent is in, in London is actually French, 300,000 people there were, I don't know how many there are now, 300,000 people, um, French people in, in London, principally in the financial sector, then I think London, uh, sorry, Paris will definitely benefit from London's fall, a somewhat negative way to put it. Okay, good. Um, I, I just want to... Because the presentation, because there were lots of questions before it took longer, I want, I want to dash through some of the sectors. We've, we've covered residential, which I think is good. Um, what about hotels? Um, let's just briefly pick that up. You're, you, you said at the beginning that you were investing heavily in hotels. There was also discussions earlier about that. Um, where are the opportunities? Is that Do you see that as a cross France? What, what's, your, what, what's your view on the hotel sector? Uh, hotels for us is a strong bet. Um, we were maybe uh, one of the, the first, uh, I would say, uh, organized investor to uh, to uh, uh, invest a lot in this uh, in this sector. It was uh, uh, more than ten years ago when we first uh, bought uh, from Accor uh, some uh, some nice portfolio uh, all over France and also uh, Belgium. Uh, we really like this asset class because basically. We were speaking with Rezi about demography. Uh, there is a bit about demography in the in the long-term trends of uh, uh, of, um, of uh, hospitality sector, but most importantly, or maybe equal, is about tourism. And tourism, with the massive flow that were coming every year and increasingly coming every year from Asia, for instance, is a huge opportunity for this uh, industry to continue to develop and for uh, uh, revenue of hotel to continue to develop. Uh, just one figure on Accor. Maybe you, you saw uh, uh, yesterday or two years ago that there, there was an investor day of Accor uh, trying to give some, um, I would say, outlook on how they will move forward after the split between the, the real estate part of Accor and the service. Um, they, they, their objective is to double their EBITDA uh, in uh, three or four years. So it's quite massive. Huh? It's uh, basically apart from uh, 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 development, acquisition, opening of new, uh, uh, new rooms, but it's also organic growth that is strong on this market. So for a real estate investor that uh, 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 want to gain exposure on these two Two uh, uh, things that are demography and also tourism, uh, uh, on top of GDP, obviously, it's uh, an asset class that is really interesting. Uh, but you need to, uh, you know, it's uh, it's quite uh, 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 difficult also to uh, to uh, to address this uh, this uh, asset class because. Obviously, it's a bit volatile historically, maybe a bit more than offices. Uh, so you need to uh, to um, take into account that and being very uh, diversified, having a, a European platform, uh, being in Paris, in Milan, in Berlin, Madrid, in the uh, I don't know in 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 the in the south of Spain, etc. In order to uh, address also this point that is has always been a true point uh, uh, on this uh, on this uh, on this sector. So. Uh, uh, yeah, this is something also, uh, and, and we were talking about uh, uh, London office. Uh, we, on the other side, we have just invested on uh, uh, hotels in London, specifically, and more generally in the main uh, uh, cities such as uh, 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 Edinburgh, etc. Uh, because we think that, uh, on the other side, the opportunity of this uh, uh, Brexit has impacted directly the prices. And if you believe, which is our case today, that uh, 
anyway on the long term uh, uh, London will will come back uh, uh, having the opportunity to enter in this market uh, with price that have been adjusted is a good entry point also to uh, uh, to take some market share and have uh, um, uh, the, the the capacity to grab some trophy asset at interesting entry point yeah that that's uh, that, that I share that view being understood that what made uh, the UK so successful has been a crazy development since the 70s when the UK was not in such a good shape via a massive integration within EU. And so if uh, it takes the same time to recover when exiting the EU, that might be in 40 years that the uh, UK becomes super uh, performing again. So the timing here I agree on the principle, but the timing uh, is really a question mark to me. I must, I must bring you to the London version of this next week. Did you want to get that? Yeah, only uh, on one side. Uh, Brexit is certainly something we are looking into, and it will not happen from one day to the other. You will not move 1,000 people out of a, a trading floor in London into Paris from one day to another. There must be trading going on in London, and they will more or less over two or three years bring constantly people over. But if you look on the on the take up in the market of office space, uh, directly close to our office, Rue de Boissy, somebody had uh, rented office space, an American bank, for about 1,000 traders. So uh, nobody is currently sitting in the office, but uh, that shows simply how people are thinking about that. And so far, I think it's important to keep that in mind that that will gradually happen. But we have uh, rolled out the red carpet, as we say, by going over to London and get uh, the right portion of Brexit into, into, into France. Second, I think what is right for market price for hotels is Brexit. It's our headache currently because we are refinancing the hotels because uh, exactly what you just said might be the interesting purchase prices which is an headache for a bank to say, what, what do we do now? Uh, can we not do a refinancing now? Because, because everybody would like to stay with the hotel. Uh, family offices are keeping these hotels as a kind of a safeguard for a couple of years already, for, for not to say for the next generation. So that is their point of view. So uh, the dynamics in the market show that from investor to investor, it will come into different, how to say it, into different problem zones and so far, I think it's interesting that uh, we are talking about investment and other people are talking about asset management, staying there where they are, and which raises also an, a number of high questions how to do that in a proper way. I just wanted to add a statistic that I heard the other day, which is that there are 450,000 bankers in London and 75,000 in Frankfurt. So we don't need too many to move for it to have a material effect on the market. No, that's, it's interesting. Um, let, let's pick up on, on a couple of the, the, other, the other sectors. Um, logistics um, has been high on everybody's view, but on the other hand, retail has been very negative. Leave Union, um, union investment were on the panel um, yesterday in Frankfurt, and this is the first year that there's, so far at least, there's not been a major shopping centre transaction. Um, that they've done everything has been focused on office mainly. Um, do you think that um, retail is actually an opportunity waiting to happen, or does everybody have a negative view on it? Hmm. Should I start? <laughs> um, I think it's, retail is fascinating. Having spent quite a lot of the last seven years in retail, um, I find it both fascinating and, and painful, I suppose. So, the first thing to state, which is obvious, the effect of the internet has prob was probably understated. Uh, and we've seen that in the USA and more recently in the UK. Now, we all thought that, um, or most, many of us thought that we'd see a polarization of retail products. So we'd see the super regional shopping centers winning and the local convenience centers uh, or, or high street uh, offer also winning and everything in between would be decimated. That seems to have played out, certainly in the UK. Um, there are very few buys for mid mid-sized shopping centres in the UK. In fact, I know of at least one group who is buying retail warehousing in the UK and turning it back to logistics because the value is higher as logistics than it is as retail, which is a major shift 
in the model. Um, but I think what perhaps we didn't, didn't really take account of when we talked about polarization of retail was what would happen in the meantime. So the death of the mal, as use someone else's term, has been a very slow death indeed. And certainly in the UK, and I think we're starting to see it on the continent as well, many of the mid-sized centers that really don't have a place anymore, don't have a client anymore, are dying very slowly and in their, in their death they're offering extremely attractive terms to tenants. So they might offer three years rent free in the UK for example to steal tenants from the super regional. So in doing that they're really polluting the, the, the prime end of the market and I think that is what we're seeing at the moment in the UK and I think it'll feed through to values. Uh, I think uh, I have a headline when I was last time in London, I was a headline, 50 Debenham shops will be closed down. So I think that's something which is uh, giving a little bit of kind of a headline for everybody. And I think uh, what we are seeing is that uh, a lot of people are talking about uh, small logistics centers in the inner city. That does mean if there should be, for example, a parking space or a parking house which should be transformed, everybody's thinking about should we not put put into that logistics because the last mile in the city where people are promising you click, you buy and an hour later the asset is more or less brought to your home, that's something which raises a number of logistical problems and uh, the questions around that is certainly something everybody's looking into and it might be that Debenhams closing down the shops will perhaps in the inner city have then all of a sudden a small logistics center there. Uh, and brings me also back to the connect the connection between the different uses of buildings. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, Duc Duel, uh, who was saying uh, that they see to piggyback on the experience between different asset classes and uses of the asset classes, hotel and resi, for example. And I think here is something which could also come together by saying how can we do that in the inner city, bringing things together into the same building. So I think that is something which uh, a lot of people are looking into. Uh, on the other side, you have also Amazon today who are looking for shops because from time to time people would like to touch, see and try the asset they are buying. So they are also trying to have one or the other shop that people can come by. So the question is simple, how to strike the balance between both, what is the right leverage, and also the urbanistic approach. Look what's going on in Paris with uh, having no parking space. If you have to get into the city and to buy something, you have to carry it with you or take a taxi or Uber or taking a bus or the metro. So I think uh, something which is outside the inner circle, people are moving to get into into retail, but in a large scale, and also all the kind of shopping centers you know in the periphery of Paris, they are always overwhelmed. And I think if you look at the, the urbanistic strategy or policy of a, of a city, will certainly have a major impact on that. Okay, good. I mean, it was interesting. We've got, um, we did a couple of sessions at, at MAPIC, um, particularly looking at that. One of the things that was interesting is there was a whole section which was around virtual reality. Um, but in fact, people weren't using virtual reality in their home to try things on because you couldn't walk around, so you couldn't mm -hmm. think. So, in fact, shopping centres were converting areas to be places where you went to try your virtual reality things on and then buy them. Um, so it's creating a, an experience. Um, and there was a, there's, there's a lot of things around that. It's interesting just to see how, how things are, are beginning to change more back towards experience or convenience. Um, and food becoming a significant part of it really is that you're not going necessarily just just to shop. Yeah, exactly. I think um, shopping malls will not disappear, far from that, at least those who are well located. The, the question today is more uh, pricing, i.e. the rental value of these areas. It might be slightly lower today uh, if, uh, if sales are, are decreasing. Nevertheless, uh, it doesn't really impact uh, the need to have a shopping center where people uh, meet. And also that forces uh, investors and uh, uh, operators to think about new ways to, uh, to improve sales. And in, indeed, restaurants, uh, food, cinemas is, is critical here. What, what we heard when we were talking about shopping centers was that you have to create an experience. They are not coming in to buy, but they are looking for an experience. So you must have restaurant, music, exhibitions, whatever it might be. 
and so far it's not that you get there to buy your stuff you need, it's simply to get there on a Saturday afternoon because you have nothing to do, and by the way, you might buy something. So uh, it's a kind of shift at least if you talk to the developers of shopping centers, what they are looking to do inside. Uh, you have Tesla now putting a car into, into that where you may drive it um, hypothetically, uh, and then they are not selling it in the shopping center. But you have a kind of only an exhibition place where you can have a look at it and taste, uh, have a first taste of it. So it's completely changing the functionality from my personal perception to what people are doing nowadays. And my, my interesting fact is when I was doing the world mapping, uh, I looked back to see what happened when Selfridges opened. Did everybody around them complain? Uh, and to a certain extent they did, but what Selfridges was doing was providing exactly what you're talking about then, which was experience, the ability to go in and look and be amazed and be entertained, and that's exactly what it was doing 100 years ago. Exactly, which doesn't mean that the, the, the rental values should increase. It, it's a different type of, uh, of uh, say, I mean, what we're seeing is a high number of visitors. Now what has to follow is a high sales. It's not necessarily correlated. So, uh, yeah, that's the um, challenge because, here. Because you're here, um, just give us an update, if you will, just on the, on the financing side. What, uh, what do you see yeah. financing? Any, any big trends people should be looking for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it was very interesting to hear Richard Mal with his uh, research and to hear you all. Um, and, and basically, I hear a lot of uh, enthusiasm, and, and that's nice because that's my character, I would say, and we need to have clients who are enthusiastic because they make business and then we make business with them. The point is, um, what we hear in terms of uh, perspectives, in terms of uh, a form of a message whereby values would not be that correlated to interest rates, I see as, say, one of the various possible scenarios, and if it if it materializes, it's 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 great, and that might well be. But uh, our role is to be prudent and know that other scenarios might happen as well. Being a banker, I look at interest rates, and I see it as sorry the main driver for values of real estate, generally speaking, today whether from commercial or residential. Everyone agrees on the fact that rates will increase. Even our clients do so. They uh, ask for loan-to-value flexibility throughout the life of the loans. So that, that reflects it very clearly. The point is we must be prepared and know that if values go down just because of interest rates going up, then we need to know that we have preserved uh, our profitability, uh, which means our uh, capital, and, and that we can continue serving our clients as a, as a bank, unlike what happened 10, 12 years ago. So I would say pricing is key today. Understanding that uh, it's difficult to have a level of risk which is high in essence due to the fact that we are at the, the peak of the real estate um, watch, can hardly um, uh, live with the fact that margins, so the cost of risk, is uh, super low. Uh, we as lenders have to have uh, capital uh, for each loan that we make and we need to uh, ensure that this capital is paid if values uh, go down. And that is only ensured if the risk is remunerated. So that, that's a big challenge today. Sorry, I just wanted to maybe hear some of your perspectives in terms of the Irish market. Obviously, it's a relatively unique micro market, but with the huge number of international players and a lot of EMEA or EU headquarters in Dublin, particularly um, in the uh, technology sector um, and the large, uh, the large companies like Google and Facebook, etc. 
Um, and there's a huge focus on innovation and fintech at the moment, um, we see. So, I mean, I just wondered maybe if you had some thoughts on, on what the perspective is um, in terms of the Dublin market and whether the draw of common law and the English speaking workforce and talent, etc., is really as, um, as profitable as uh, we like to think it is potentially in Dublin um, and European perspective on that. Anybody want to pick that up? I'll, I'll tell you the perspective yesterday from, from Germany was that they actually thought that Dublin would be one of the cities that would benefit most from, from Brexit. Interesting. Uh, well, I uh, from a lawyer's perspective, I can only say that a lot of British money, which is fearing Brexit, is transferring to Dublin to get then invested into continental Europe. That is at least what we see from our lawyer's perspective. I think uh, if you have, if I have the, the picture well in mind from the presentation this morning about the market, you have seen it was really dark, dark, dark. There's growth. There is. Uh, um, no unemployment, the, everything was, all parameters were looking very, very well, economically speaking. So I think it's a strong market, but a, a small market. So I think there's not a lot of invest, foreign investors getting into Dublin because it is a very, very narrow market. And if you are not, have not the right connections, you get lost. And so far, I think there's a little bit of problem. Most of the foreigners get wishing to get there have really as a problem. Uh, and even I can tell one of our investors, which is a high net worth individual, looking to buy two hotels. He was in the end round and he always lost against an Irish bar. So therefore, I think it's really the problem that as a foreigner, we have uh, really a problem to get into that market. But the, but the economics are fine. The framework is good. I'm not, not, not good with Dublin at all. The only, the only thing I would say is, is that Dublin or Ireland in general was a key beneficiary of the EU. I think it'll be a key beneficiary of Brexit, and they're very good. The Irish people, if I may, are very good at exploiting those opportunities. The key thing for me to see will be how they deal with the crisis that's surely coming, because last time round it was very painful for Ireland. So building resilience in the system, I think, is a key, got to be a key thing on the agenda for Ireland. Um, so if we're looking to 2019 and beyond, um, where do you think these good people should, should invest their money? What, what do you think is going to give the best return? And you can judge whether or not we've got uh, you know, high risk or not. Or, um, so, but where do you, what do you see as, as, as really an, as an attractive opportunity in, in the current market? Well, I think that uh, Comigo would be a good, a good guy, huh? uh, and I, I owe you that. <laughs> But, but definitely, there are, there are so many opportunities in the conversion process. And, uh, and when you, you can't see any building uh, which have been built between the 50s and, and the 80s without thinking this, this building should not be not an office building anymore. So it's just a question of time. And, and uh, a lot of asset managers, sometimes they don't have the means, they don't have the people, they don't have the right because something is just not the legal purpose of the fund. To, to make some big conversion, to make some big capex, or maybe just to have some resi. And so there are a lot of things to do to provide solutions to the existing investors owning all these all these assets, and we're very happy to help them to, to create some value. Well, uh, it's always difficult to predict, and I, I always think uh, people that are trying to, to predict things are really courageous because most of the time it's not occurring. So uh, uh, what we need to do is just to, uh, as was uh, mentioned by, by uh, Benjamin, was to, to prepare. Prepare in case, and uh, uh, the, the, our, our job is to, to, to make, uh, uh, I would say, the best, uh, the, the, the best asset in the market to, uh, to be able to anticipate anything that would, uh, could occur and to benefit from rental growth if it's the base case that will, uh, will happen. So that means that uh, uh, I think if we take into consideration uh, from our perspective the main risk, uh, apart from macro that we cannot do anything with, uh, is uh, uh, obsolescence uh, of assets. And second thing is, uh, um, and thank you for that because it's more and more important, experience with customers. It's the case we, we talk a lot with uh, uh, on retail, but it's obviously the case on hotels and more and more for offices. And if you're not able to uh, take that into account in the way that you are managing your, uh, your real estate, 
it would be more and more difficult to attract new customers. And I think that the, the main objective for real estate companies, uh, for investors, is to be sure that you're not just, okay, building an asset and renting it, but you need to service it also. And, and that's more than important in the future. It's only the beginning, I think, for, for, for uh, uh, office spaces. And that's why, in terms of, uh, I would say, priority of investment, uh, if I have to continue to, and I will have to continue to invest in our portfolio, it's about development. Development is the only way today uh, to, uh, I would say, make good return with a level of risk that is not consistent with what we've seen before because the outlook is quite positive for this market. You see that and it's more and more important to have this precise view. Uh, uh, the different uh, uh, vacancy rate of, uh, of market uh, to split between second end and primary and new or restructured asset. You see that the vacancy rate for new asset is extremely low. It's the case in Paris, but uh, we, we've not discussed, and I did not discuss about one of our key markets today where I expect to, um, uh, to continue to develop, is Milan. Milan, you have a vacancy rate of 10%. You say, okay, wow, it's huge because when you compare with other European cities, it's a, a bit crazy, so oh, 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 can you imagine uh, make money on this market? In fact, th there is almost nothing in terms of new or restructured buildings. And on the same time, the, the prime rents in Milan has increased by more than 10% during the last 12 months. And why is that? Because there's no product. And it's even more important on the level of uh, market growth uh, than in Paris, in fact, because Paris is much more mature and Milan has a lot to do in terms of uh, catching up the quality of uh, office space that we can have here in Paris. So I would say mostly development in Paris and Milan, and, and, and there's really no choice between those two because I think those two are interesting. And if I have to, uh, uh, I don't have the expertise of development, uh, I would choose maybe uh, also hotels because as I said, uh, uh, hotel is a, a, a nice play. There is maybe much less competition in terms of investor, so still attractive yield with a, a, a macro trend that should uh, support the development of this asset class. Okay, good. Charles. Thank you. Um, I think it's a tricky question because the market's not going to give us much for the next, maybe for the next year, but not for the next five years, which is probably the question we should ask. So I think you need to rephrase the question. Um, at this point in the cycle, I think we need to be looking as to where we can add value as real estate investors. What, what can we change? What can we challenge about the existing model? And there are three sort of themes that seem pretty obvious to me in most markets and certainly in, in Paris since we're here. Um, the first one, I guess, would be the, the future of offices. We've seen the rise of co-working, and actually Paris is one of the biggest cities for co-working in the world. Um, it's not clear to me that the co-working model as it exists today is going to be the model we end up with in 10 years' time, but it's pretty clear to me that we're having a blurring of the lines between office and hotel. Finally, offices are not necessarily places to work, they're places to collaborate, places to meet. And hotels are not necessarily places to sleep, they're also places to eat, places to, to meet people. So I wonder whether the next, um, the next leader in the new office is perhaps a hotel company, not, a, not an office company. I wonder whether Accor is better at this than Land Securities. Try and pick, try and pick on an English company, not a French one. Um, the second, second area I think which is interesting at the moment is, is around technology. Um, the three challenges in real estate, I guess, the three uh, and Bête Noire, since we're in France, are probably accessibility. Accessing real estate is quite difficult for most people because it comes in large lumps. Um, transparency of price. The, pr the price of real estate is something you find out when you sell it, really. Um, sorry to the valuers in the room. And then finally, liquidity. So I think there, there are a number of companies that are trying to address one or all three of those issues at the moment. Um, it's been a long time that we've talked about these issues, but these issues are what you call the risk premium. This is why the risk premium exists. So there's a clear value add to, to changing that. Uh, and in London, at least, there are certainly um, three or four companies I could, I could name that are attempting that at the moment. And then the final area, which we've almost done to death because uh, of Raphael's uh, opening speech, would be residential, and particularly managed residential right now. I think there's an enormous amount to do 
uh, in many markets, but particularly in the French market, I think that when you go into managed residential, um, you've got a sort of baseline trend which is kind of positive because of demographics and where the cycle is, which is going to keep you safer through the cycle. It doesn't mean you get away with the cycle, but it'll keep you safer in the cycle. And so much to do. The challenges are how do you get scale, which I think is what you you said earlier. How do you get the scale and how do you change the model in a market where like in France, where the, where the developers really don't take any risk at all because they can, they can forward sell <clears throat> everything and they can, they can option land. So it's, it's, not, it's not an easy one to tackle, but if someone gets that right, I think that'll be, that'll be the model. That'll be the place to go. Okay, good. It's a very difficult question. If I was to invest in the coming uh, years with the need to uh, sail in, in five years, I would not invest a lot in real estate. I would only go for schemes where there is some uh, value add uh, behind because otherwise on a, on a flat asset I would uh, fear that my uh, capital is not uh, say preserved for the coming uh, five years. If there is some uh, added value which means that there is some expertise behind it, that you have the capacity to create that value by being a very good developer for instance then I certainly would uh, put some money uh, at work uh, and I would do so in, a, in an asset class which is not too sensitive to uh, interest rate fluctuations. Uh, we've seen uh, assets with traditionally yields which are much higher than uh, office, like uh, logistics for instance, where yields have uh, gone down in a, in a crazy way. That shows that it's sensitive to uh, the, the monetary policy. Not sure I would uh, focus on, on these ones. So rather office, Student housing in cities which are attractive to young people, Barcelona, Berlin, clearly Berlin, that sort of places, and clearly I, I could not put too much money at work these days. Okay, mm -hmm. Alfred. Uh, for a lawyer, it was always uh, by nature risk uh, adverse, so uh, it's difficult to give a, a clear answer on that. But I think uh, micro living and student housing, I think, were certainly in the reach for a lawyer to invest in. And I think that are also the areas where, for example, also the kind of a mind change is happening in uh, society, at least in France. Formerly, people did not lay, leave their ho families at home uh, over the week to go to a bigger city to work. But now it is absolutely normal to do that. So they are leaving for three, four days, looking for a nice small apartment, must not be big. And in so far, I think that's something I see, and students, because uh, we have uh, a lot of students coming in the big cities, and accommodation is really uh, a problem for that. Uh, thank you to the panel, and if you could all join me in thanking ourselves, that would be great. Thank you. Everybody.